Hey everybody, Edo here, and I am excited today because I have Gon Beezy of Thunder Griff Games on the line. Say hello, Gon. Hey everyone. Hey Ed. Hey, and so uh, Gon is the founder of Thunder Griff. It's a distributed organization uh, in Spain. You're based in Rome, um, Argentina, I believe, if I got that right. Um, but yes. these different hubs, but you sort of came to the Kickstarter space, you know, starting, I think, believe with overseer or overseers, yeah, over, that's correct. overseers, and then have just progressively done hit after hit. And I think you also have a pretty interesting business model as well. So what I like to do in all of these conversations is start just a little bit with your origin story, how you came, um, to board games and then how you know you started building this company yeah so i came from the video game industry uh i started when i was 22 uh and you're only like 24 uh, now man i mean come on no <laughs> but um yeah it was a very fast process a learning curve for me in the video game industry and at the end i opened a company and we were publishing uh, MMORPGs, a massively multiplayer online games that you had to download. We were jigs of, of data, and then you played for free, and then you could purchase these little things. Was there um, any, anyone I would have heard of? or I don't think so, because we were operating mainly in South America. Okay. So I brought uh, already, game, uh, already uh, developed games in Korea, and then we published I in see. South America. Okay. And... Uh, but merely it was it was that until a point that um, Facebook came in with all these little games and then uh, the apps and the iOS and the Google Play Store and basically in a matter of five or six years everything changed so drastically and my company wasn't that big to uh, afford these changes every time so I decided to look for something that were, uh, would last over time. And that's why I discovered board games, and I decided to sell my uh, my old, my company and get uh, two years for studying and analyzing how this industry works to then start my own publisher. It was three at the end, so we started two years ago as a publisher, <laughs> and uh, it's been fantastic so far, indeed. Yeah, and 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 you guys have been doing some stellar work. So you know. You, you you had a successful past life in games, uh, you wanted to change industries, you sold your company, giving you a little bit of a window. So in mm -hmm. this research and studying of board games, before having done it, just when you were peering into the industry, this yeah. is going to be a two-part question. Part one is like, what did you learn or think you learned at, at that phase? And then once you actually got into the industry, what of those things turned out to be totally wrong? Oh, all right, all right. Uh, quite a lot, but uh, I think that it's a learning process. It was like merely soaking in uh, knowledge of uh, board games and just play them. So what I, I found myself selling all my video game collection and start buying board games and, and playing with my friends. And uh, it was interesting because I really wanted to play a, a lot and uh, and there's not much time to do so. And uh, But my friends, we gather up basically twice per week sometimes and it was a, a very good experience because uh, up to that moment i just knew as everybody the mass market games and uh, i hadn't played even carcassonne or, or Catan, the very basic new uh new experiences and um so it was a very steep uh but i i immediately got into the mass market with sushi go and, and, and more simpler games and after a while, let's say four or five months, something clicked and I wanted something a little bit more than that without being overwhelming, of course. But I, I really wanted to make my mind work a little bit more, let's say. Uh, so then I understood that there was a market for it. Uh, some, some people just talk them like gateway market or, or something like that. I think it's, it's a midway into, into those two. And, uh, I wanted to make games like that and uh, that were simpler and simple to look, simple to play. And then with these little things that stimulates your mind, but at the same time, never, never everything is, is not overwhelming. Yeah, there's a real sweet and, spot there for sort of accessible, simple, easy to teach, easy to play games that have a little bit more to them that 
um, you know, both new players and, and gamers can sort of dig into, um, you know, I, and quite a number of your titles do in fact do that, but that there, there is a nice little zone there for that type of game. It's true. It's true. So that's probably the most valuable thing I learned in, in the first part. And then was just, uh, I, I learned from all the blogs and interesting uh, articles online from James Math, Jamie Stegmeier, and as everybody, I just tried to read everything I could and buy books and, and stuff about crowdfunding. And at the same time, I already knew that I wanted to build something like those games I liked. And then uh, we started like that. And so let's talk about Overseers for a second. Now, I haven't played Overseers, um, and but it was a, a, a rock-solid initial campaign. I think you did maybe 60,000 euro. I don't know what currency it was. Euros. Uh, 60, yes, we, yeah, euros, which is what? <laughs> I think like 40, 40 or 50 grand, something like that? Is it uh, that way or the other way? Probably around 70 is the other way around. So it's the other way around. Okay, 70 grand, which is a, a <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah, a really fantastic start. So heading into that, I'm just curious, uh, how did Overseers come together from a design perspective and then from, from a, you know, pulling together the product? What, ex what, what tools and techniques did you bring from video games to build it? And then, mm -hmm. you know, how did you sort of go into the Kickstarter phase there? Yeah, the, the funny thing is that we didn't make that, that game. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, it, I know it's um, it was the first attempt to publishing publish something. Okay, so you straight up published it. Really, yes, I did publish uh, because it was a, a Taiwanese game that I discovered in in one of my uh, visits to Spio Essen, and we were one year behind because at the end, instead of being two years, it got us three years to learn something more. And we didn't have something solid yet, so we decided to get another title, publish that, and work through uh, through the other ones as our uh, own design. Um, well, but so that's that a, being that, said, that, that's a bold move, right? Because that means because it, it you did it, run the Kickstarter, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it yeah. was a already published title in Taiwan, and we just got it and got the rights for worldwide, and uh, we launched a Kickstarter based on that. Uh, we saw an additional tweaks in, in the roles, but mainly it was that product, which I think it was very artisty, very beautiful to see, and uh, it was a bluffing game. So at the beginning, I really wanted to make something like that because it's one of my favorite mechanics. Uh, so I decided to publish that, and then up to that point, trying uh, I, will, I was trying to understand the, the identity of the company, that now it's, it's quite far from the party bluffing game. Uh, sure, feeling. sure. Well, mm -hmm. and 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 it was such a beautiful game to pick. So then, no. So now, I, I guess I I remember now you've done these publishing things. So uh, next up was Tao Long, right? Is that correct? Exactly. That was a, a Brazilian designer, a couple of designers uh, that presented that game to me in uh, in Spiel Essen, and I immediately got in love with it uh, because I I really like abstracts, even if I I suck at chess. But at, at the same time, I, I like how uh, the mind needs to work step further in the process uh, to understand which is the best way to play. Um, and and, the, and that right. game really impressed me. And Sorry? Well, f finish what you're saying. Yeah, and basically what, that was it. I played the game. I liked it very much. And uh, we started working through it. And uh, it was an amazing experience to work with these guys. And we launched a Kickstarter uh, six months after the third month. And Oops. and that I mean that you know that, that first Kickstarter campaign, albeit you you just found a title that you loved that looked beautiful and you you know you presented it in a wonderful way. Tao Long, you know that's a title that had six thousand backers plus, you know I, whatever the conversion is three hundred fifty grand, some, mm -hmm. you know something of that nature, um, cool. as an abstract, as just pretty, you know that kind of game, and that's a that's a huge campaign. Um, so like off to the races, right? And was there, did, did you sort of, were you, did you know in your skin that that was going to happen? Were you surprised by that, that it took off? I mean, how? Absolutely not. It, it was a surprise to me. I mean, we, we did everything we knew that we learned from overseers. And then we tried to do a little bit more uh, marketing and, and, and try to build up the campaign way further in advance. 
Uh, and it was the beginning was mind blowing. I mean, we did use early bird, which I know it's it's not a common practice, but uh, we like to do that. And and finally, it's the first three days were really surprising to us. And I remember sitting down with the entire team and and the guys in in Brazil, and I said we need to add more stuff to the game in terms of uh, modular things and such. And we entered into a uh, very fast development of these modular uh, modular ideas that we had in mind for the campaign. And they started to illustrate that at the same time because we had around 15 stretch goals. And in two weeks, we managed to create some, some more even with the help of the community. So they were asking something and we were making that for them together with them. And it was... A really enlightening experience for us because it was not just surprising, but it was exciting to have this much communication. And uh, I feel this is one of the most interesting things of Kickstarter for sure. Uh, I, I agree, and actually, you know, I know Jamie's big on that, and I, I've done it in different ways on different campaigns. But so, as a company with Thunder, so you you, you have this first game, which is your publishing. It's a, it's a solid Kickstarter. Presumably at that time, after the Kickstarter, you're getting into sort of the retail and distribution market. Mm -hmm. um, and then coming into this campaign, now suddenly this is, you know, this is a, a big success. This is a huge print run to start with. You have a lot of units, right? Um, then you, so take me through this sort of interesting pivot because you, you and if, if I'm getting the, the game order correct, but you do tell long, it's this big game, a hit by all measures on Kickstarter. I don't know how it did afterwards. Um, and then you have Dead Man's Doubloons, which is sort of, if you just look at your page, seemingly a, of a different feel from all your other stuff. And then you also do Pot the Vin, or however you pronounce that well, um, which correct. I understand skipped Kickstarter, right? And went straight to retail. Yeah. So like, yeah. what was that phase of your company like? Um, so as soon as we end up with Tao Long, we had an overwhelming amount of work and uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone to go on development while Star is going and that was absolutely a mistake from us. Uh, but at the same time, it really pushed our boundaries of learning through that, through that experience. And of course, there was a delay uh, and it was not, not a small one. Uh, but with that, we understood a lot about logistics, about how to pack in items inside the boxes. And basically, Talon was the, the best learning experience so far in, in, in this time in the industry. Um, then we wanted to create a new segment of customers, you may say. And we wanted to make something uh, detached from Talon, uh, because for a moment, I thought that uh, having just the same amount of games, uh, the same category, sorry, will maybe make you like a mold, a publisher with a mold that always does the same. And I was, I, I, don't, I didn't know that it was risky move or not, but I decided to create a new segment and we did this uh, very cutthroat uh, pirate game uh, that I always wanted to, to play. And um, uh, I discovered it with Jason uh, Misedis, an, uh, an American uh, designer. And uh, and we we made this game, and I wanted to make it pretty, so we did uh, a big game out of it. And uh, and this was basically our experiment, uh, our experiment to understand if that market was something we are we were comfortable. With. And and after that, uh, we went directly into distribution with Podivan, which is was the the first one of our small line of games, which is uh, now the, our main focus through the year. Um, but uh, yeah, it was three different, very different uh, scenarios uh, that made us understand what was the direction we wanted to go through after that. Right. So and this is what the first year uh, we were experimenting. With. And so, and so you go through that, and then you know you basically come back with uh, Spirits of the Forest, mm -hmm. massively successful. I mean, you've become. There are a few different companies out there that are basically the kinds, you know, like, hey, look at what they've done in their campaign. They're going to be sort of leading the way in terms of effort, and it's going to be a success. You've sort of gotten to that tier. It's sort of, you know... That's really you know, kind of you. I, yeah, I think Gamelin's in that tier. Roxley's in that tier. Jamie was in that tier before he backed out of Kickstarter. 
Um, mm-hmm. And there's 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 a number of others, but um, you you it seems like you've really sort of established. I mean, Tang Garden starts getting a little bigger with all the mini the the construction pieces and stuff like yeah. that. But you've sort of gotten into that beautiful abstract, you know, very engaging art um, space. Is that now, have you honed in on that? Is that now your brand or are you still experimenting outside of that? It is now. It is now. I mean, it's uh, starting with Spirits of the Forest. Uh, we we uh, shaped the game towards the art direction we want to, um, to keep uh, using in our games, that's for sure. Uh, so that would be somehow our our identity. So it's abstract games with our, which are very very thematized. Thematized? Can you say that? Uh, with a strong thematic, let's say. Oh, oh thematized. That uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I get it. And um, and the plays in 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 just a few minutes and or less than an hour. And at the end, they will give you some uh, some choices without being overwhelming. So that is our at the end our our identity as a company, that's for sure. And well, the next games that are coming, there are a couple of them that still we want to experiment on them. Uh, one being Edelston, which is a deck builder, which is um, a more complex strategy because you're building two engines at the same time. Uh, but those um, will be mainly one per year per year. So with one title we experiment and with the rest we we try to build up something that uh, has the roots of the company. Well, and, and build up build up you have, right? I mean Spirits of the Force is getting into seven thousand plus backers, you know, whatever, five hundred thousand dollars, and then you're at ten thousand backers with uh Tang Garden and maybe a million dollars depending on how you do that conversion math. So you know, clearly you're hitting that audience. I mean, if so- something that I've learned, and and this might be helpful, is your company has a brand, um, but it's not really your identity is not uh, uh, the br- your brand identity in board games. From my perspective, can fit your the audience that identifies with that brand. And what I mean to say is like, yeah. Um, I think you can you can maintain and have a brand that identifies as these abstract, fully beautiful, fantastic games, and you're going to continue to build and build on that audience, and that audience and you know grow and grow. But it, in an odd way, it's sort of siloed. And if you're over here and you make some sort of other brand, and you're like, hey, here's another line with this kind of stuff, as long as that's an engaging audience that 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 wants that, they can both grow, and they don't have to. They can sometimes overlap, but it's not. I mean, I think that's one of the places where people. Um, struggle with when they you know when they want to make different things it's as much about thinking about what your brand is as it is it's just understanding the audience that you've created that's coming back mm-hmm. again and again and and what they're interested in looking for as well right so i think there's a lot of space to do that while still having that centerpiece Absolutely. i mean it's uh, we are engaged to uh to to the audience that really like uh, the type of games that are abstract but at the, at the end it's also fun to explore new possibilities and see if uh, if we can create a new segment and we can keep building this kind of games that we all like to make. I mean, it's, we are not just liking one type. We just sometimes we just want to experiment and see if we like to do something else. Yeah, so, it's yeah. fun to make yeah. games, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. uh, um, well, and so a question, and 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 so then your last one, and we've gone through the whole thing here, but that is um, Roland Ranch, which is a Roland Wright. Nice look to it, very reminiscent of Pot de Vin. Um, and that's direct to retail as well, right? Yes, yes. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a small game, same small factor as Spears of the Forest Retail and, and Pulvan. And this one is going directly into distribution because it's, it's a game that is compact. And the gameplay, it's, uh, it's very simple. And at the end, it's not modular in terms of expansions or or this kind of thing. So I think for Kickstarter, it's very important that you have a product that can expand drastically. And, uh, and that's why, uh, well, if, this if you have million of... dollars, can- million dollar campaigns, you need to. <laughs> not, not, it's always unexpected though. It's, uh, but yeah, it's, of course it's, it's great, but at the same time, it's, uh, you know, Kickstarter is a huge amount of effort, and you know that very well. And sometimes for a small game like this, it's just worth to 
make advertisement and go directly to retail for sure. Well, and, and certainly now that you are in retail, right? Like the more you've put out regular products, you have relationship with distributors, you have relationships with, with retailers and stores. So tucking in an extra game where you're like, hey, at that point, they don't care if it's been to Kickstarter or not. Perhaps they even prefer that it hasn't been to Kickstarter. So one of the things I was curious about, and, and, and thanks for taking the time to just go through the, the, the lineup, the history here. That's my um, pleasure. Because, <laughs> and then, and, and, you know, there's going to be another 20 games in the next five years. But you've, I mean, clearly you're able to work and generate a, a large amount of upfront uh, investment through Kickstarter, which is, allows you to create these fantastic games. But you're also doing direct to retail. If you mm -hmm. were to, and, and only to the extent you're comfortable talking, uh, explain, if you were to sort of, break out your revenue not to the not the specifics but how much would you say is coming from the for your from your business how much is, uh, of it comes from the kickstarters what percentage would you say happens in retail like what's your balance in terms of where um your your revenue is coming in at this point yeah so um it's a very interesting question uh so far in the process with the two years we have been going uh, since the the first title uh, we have signed some distribution. It's not large or massively. It's just we try to sign exclusive with each country in its own language. And while we have done that, we have Europe. We still have ways to go. Um, but considering the current situation, probably Kickstarter is around 70 or yes, 70 or 75 percent of that revenue. Of course, the idea is to expand distribution uh, and in a way that it will be also sustainable. But at the end, I think that with the amount of things we want to do in terms of components and uh, game experience, I think uh, the prices will be quite larger for distribution. Sure. And uh, that really helps us having fun with the product at the maximum of its, of its capabilities and then uh, go into retail with, uh, with the proper uh, game etc sure, sure i mean there's certainly companies that hit that point especially when they're doing more fantastic looking things to simply say going through distribution and retail is, takes so much out of the pie that we'd rather be direct to consumer and and put that money towards the, the cost i mean it depends on how you want to scale and build your business but there is mm -hmm. that that angle there but so, i mean that that's telling though that i mean basically that's saying yeah i mean and you have some very large campaigns but still quite a bit of a very large portion of your business is the revenue generated through uh, the Kickstarter campaigns, and then there's there's certainly more more revenue as well. Um, from a print perspective, um, I mean, I, I don't know how large you typically do your runs, and in what in what category based on how successful the Kickstarter was. I mean, obviously, if it's already got twelve ten thousand backers, you're going to have to print a ton of copies, but <clears throat> of all those titles we went through, um, are there ones that are sort of on a regular cadence of reprints or are they more things that shoot up and then settle down? How have you seen sort of your ongoing printing business uh, been developing over the years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we do normally in distribution uh, regarding uh, localization or, or so, we uh, offer them to join the first print run. So we always try to make one large print run. Uh, and, and then if the title is uh, sold out in about six or seven months, we immediately do one before that happens. So it's basically the, how the game is received after it's Kickstarter and how fast it sells to allow another print run. If that doesn't happen, then it goes into the next year. Uh, so we either do an expansion for the game uh, to, to, let's say, um, uh, help the life cycle of the, of the title. Uh, and, um, and the other way around is just six months old that we start a new one. And so far with uh, most of our titles, it has been like this. So we start with a print, joint print run in four or five languages, which depending on Kickstarter, it's an extra eight to 10,000 of that number. And then we distribute to all, uh, our distribution. And if that's allowed, we already plan a new one and we welcome all the languages too. 
So we never make batches or we bring two languages and then another three languages. It's all about our uh, the number game, and the more you do, of course, the less you pay. So that's the strategy, more or less. Cool. And so, you know, again, we've we've talked a little bit about uh, retail, and we've we've talked about Kickstarter, and I do think mm-hmm. that there are lots of things that you've done uh, and been sort of a trendsetter uh, with with Kickstarter in many ways. When you when you think about the platform and you think about your do you have you announced your next game like your next Kickstarter uh, not, game okay so whatever yet. that I ge- about, and then I told myself that it was time to wait a little bit more before doing that okay so but you are going to do another one at some point yeah probably January two thousand nineteen but yes so when you're think well you're getting you're getting you're getting close to Jan that's three months from now so you it's sort of time it's to. True. To announce, man. Yeah. Um, but like, let's set that aside. When you think about Kickstarter in January, right? I mean, that's not your last yeah. camp. I mean, Hang Garden was what two months ago, three months ago, something like that. Uh, June and it ended mid uh, July. So okay. yeah, about three three and a half months ago. Um, when you and you did that campaign, and obviously it was your most successful, most backers, most pledges. When you're thinking about what you're going to do next, and you've looked and, and thought about how Kickstarter has trended and changed over the time you've been um, successful on mm-hmm. the platform, you know what are the key things that you see that are, are, are changing or on your radar when you think about Kickstarter uh, in January? Uh, so your question is related to the month? No, not the month. Or no, no, my... just, just Kickstarter in the future. Like when when you're when you're thinking about. Is there anything that you're going to do differently or things you're worried about? Like what trends are you seeing as you look towards January, but not literally the month of January? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. So I think that um, every every campaign we do, we normally try to do something uh, different. But what I'm uh, finding myself is that if you run a Kickstarter, which is consistent uh, in terms of how it reads and, and how it lasts and how it's managed, then the following, uh, the, the, the backers that are following you uh, through the campaigns will feel more familiar, and at the same time, they will feel more uh, uh, interesting. They will be interested in to interact more with you because they know how it works. Uh, so while with Kickstarter, we are trying to uh, to make them uh, in a certain way similar to each other. Uh, we have fun during the pre-marketing, so every time we try to find something interesting that will entertain um, the people that come and read about the game throughout the weeks and uh, and that then can translate in someone that is interested to back the game. So um, I think uh, when you try to plan any any of the pre-marketing or Kickstarter, it's it's just easier to work on something different before the Kickstarter rather than during the campaign. But we have ex- experimented with uh, Dead Man Doubloons and uh, the stretch goals that you can uh, that you could choose over the path and such. Uh, but it adds a lot of uh, different uh, mechanics during the campaign that translates in a lot more work towards our, our side. And so we, while we like to experiment on Kickstarter, we really want to keep, uh, keep up a schedule uh, and uh, to be sure that we can uh, accumulate all our work efforts into run a good campaign. Let's say. Sure, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the um, I have seen the consistency. On one hand, you know, it, it also just makes setting up your page easier. You're like the same things I did last time here, 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 and here. But I do think creating that uh, familiar, the back of comfort, if you want to call it, is 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 a big part of it, especially as you're doing campaign after campaign after campaign. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, uh, it looks like we've been talking for about 30 minutes. I'm just seeing if there are any other um, questions. Yeah, yeah, so so about done. I'm just trying to think if there were any other questions. I, I, um, when you're, so separate from Kickstarter specifically, uh, mm-hmm. when you look at the game industry and you're thinking about like, 2019 what what's exciting to you what do you think um you know are are you know what do you, what do you look forward to in games right now uh 
I think that uh, we already are pushing the boundaries of what you can do with a production and with a gameplay, uh, either in a small or, or big factor. And there are incredible uh, campaigns uh, on Kickstarter right now for board games, if not the most interesting that I've seen in the platform. And uh, with this overproduction, because everybody's doing tons of games and we are keep publishing them, um, there is a good amount of people that get lost in the process. Sure. And I feel like the most interesting thing that we might be uh, inspiring by, by it's seeing what others do in terms of originality or in terms of uniqueness. And uh, it's very fun and very refreshing. And I get a lot of inspiration from my Kickstarter colleagues, uh, creators. And um, I just can't wait of what the next year will bring us at this point. Uh, because it's going to bring a lot maybe, of stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I think it's maybe I'm like a dreamer or something like that, but I feel like sometimes there are games that are really, really inspiring in terms of how everything looks inside the box and how everything plays uh, when you get it out and, 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 and how the new mechanics translate into the into into the different scenarios with different people. So at, at this point, I'm, I'm really looking forward to see what else can be done with this kind of uh, board games. And it's exciting. I mean, we are getting absolutely into uh, a spot which is probably glooming of uh, blooming of creativity. Uh, blooming. So it's, I think. Good thing or yeah, bad thing. A good thing. <laughs> glooming. Glooming would be like saddening. Not glooming, but blo booming. Booming. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. There's lots of, lot, I mean, the sheer scope, scale, originality, as you talked about, people doing different and fun mechanics. And, and I still feel, you know, it's one of those challenging spaces, but a lot of people do get lost and a lot of people do miss but there is still, much like on iOS, there's still the opportunity for these weird, small, indie, or totally original, totally different titles to find their markets uh, and grow. And, and, and the most original that you can find out there, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, Don, thank you so much for your time. It was actually a pleasure to learn about all the different steps you've been through from with, with uh, Thundergriff Games. And, you know, so much fun to be <laughs> had, man. What? Yeah. Thank you for having me. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And thanks everybody for watching. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey everybody, Edo here, and thanks for watching Gaming with Edo. Reviews over here on this playlist, League and Insider videos over here on this one. Subscribe, share, all that good stuff. But most importantly, play some great games. Thanks.